It's time for Doc Talk Radio, brought to you by Gilbert Hospital and Florence and Anthem Hospitals. I'm Dr. Ann Borick, board certified in internal medicine, and I'm here to keep you up to date on the latest information pertaining to your health and well being. Welcome to Doc Talk Radio, sponsored by Gilbert Hospital and Florence Hospital at Anthem. Joe, how are you doing? Good. It's our first, our first post Christmas show. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas. How was your How was your holiday? It was good. It was good. It was nice to just kind of kind of chill out. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. It's that's been a while. That's good. 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 There's so much that I want to kind of talk about. Do you believe we've been on the air for for a year? I mean, we're approaching our one year anniversary. It seems like we were just sitting on the couch talking about it. I know. It really flies. Marie said the same thing this morning. It's amazing. She goes, it's been a year. Right. Like, and yep. you know, what I want to do today is just, you know, really open up the lines. I want to make sure that our listeners know to call in 480-745-1033. Um, I really don't have anything specific um, to talk about. It's really an open question answer session, so it's really a good time um, for those of you listening to call in and. It's like our year in review. It really is. And 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 some things that uh, and some things that I sent out this wonderful newsletter mm-hmm. that people really liked, and I was surprised at the amount of people um, we sent out forty one thousand and change, wow. which is a lot of newsletters. But I was surprised at the amount of people who who haven't heard of Doc Talk mm-hmm. and, and some of our other shows. But, but um, I, I think, and, and I've had emails with people wanting to ask, and I haven't really replied to any other than some that were like, hey, thanks for the newsletter and stuff like that. Right. But, but I've had a lot of questions of what kind of guests we've had on the show, mm-hmm. who have we had, mm-hmm. what kind of things do we talk about, what's the show like? Mm-hmm. And I think we should talk a little bit about that and kind of explain it to people because I know being that, it's that transition between Christmas and New Year's. There's still a lot of people out of town, right. um, but there's a lot of people that are sitting home that mm-hmm. are able to check out new stuff. And since I just sent this newsletter out, excellent. It's <clears throat> it's fun to know that we have a lot of new people that are going. Hmm, what's this doc talk? That you know, that's great. And let's just let's address that. You know, when we first a year ago started the doc talk radio concept, I thought you know this was a really great opportunity as a as a community outreach to, you know, sponsored by the hospital, the Gilbert ER Hospital, Florence Hospital at Anthem, to to really open up the lines and and make ourselves available to address any questions that, that, you know, the community or the public can, you know, can bring. And then I thought, well, you know, instead of me being here every day and every week, and I thought, let's bring in some of our colleagues and, and really bring it into uh, some of the specialties. So we've had, and, and we can go through a list, we've had different cardiologists. We've had Dr. Uh, Tendler, and I, I don't necessarily need to go through each name, but um, cardiologists, for example, that specialize in the electrical system of the heart. Um, we've had you know, cardiologists that do the cardiac catheterizations. We've had physical therapists on the show, uh, respiratory therapists from the hospital. Um, you know, those kinds Renowned, of Renowned uh, breast surgeon. Uh, you know, breast cancer surgeon. Last um. week, we had a cardiothoracic surgeon on the show. Um, kidney specialist talking about dialysis and you know and what goes into that. We had a um, really re, you know prominent eye surgeon, an ophthalmologist in the valley. Barnett and Delaney Absolutely. and Perkins is that what it, Perkins yeah. is that what it was? It was actually yeah, Dr. Fintelman who's with that group. Um, you know, there's a there's a retinal specialist that wants to come on. Um, so it's really intended to be uh, a show that that doesn't talk about. And I think in the beginning we said you know this is not about healthcare reform. It's not about the the politics of healthcare, it's really just about getting down to how do we maintain health and well-being. Um, and so that's kind of what, what the show is about. You know, we started talking a little bit about some of the health benefits and the foods that are good for the eye, like nutrition for the eye, for the heart. Um, what is a good cholesterol? How, you know, how do you manage that? So those are the things that, that we, were, we were talking about. Do you have some comments up there now? I, I kind of are you I'm are looking you, at the I'm looking at mm-hmm. you're actually the doc talk uh, Facebook post to see all the all the uh, oh, guests okay. that we've had on right. and yeah can I, you see I, how many this is wonderful yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. you know I wanted to share with our listeners just something uh, just today in, in clinic I had a patient come in who presented with um, a lump on the back of the wrist and really it's it's a, a ganglion cyst is something that that is pretty common and I don't know if our listeners or if you've ever heard of it but sometimes the sheath, the, the, the sheath around the nerve and the ligament of the, of the hand can um, become inflamed and it can cause a little lump. And so this patient came in to me and said, you know what, when I put my hand down, when I flex my wrist, this lump popped up just this morning. And, um, and it's a classic what we call ganglion cyst. And it, it used to be called, quote, the Bible 
um, you know, kind of a, a Bible treatment is recommended because they used to, in the olden days, take a book. A Bible treatment. And they would take the Bible and they would smash it and just kind of, you know, kind of disintegrate that cyst, which is kind of a traumatic That's thing That's pretty wild. Um, but the way we treat it now is really just to get a coin. And what I did today in clinic was I got a quarter and I just taped it. And I actually did that to myself probably a few years ago. And the cyst basically just slowly disintegrates. It, it kind of pushes it back in and the fluid, you know, spreads out and the body reaccumulates So do you it. take that quarter, do you hit it with like a ballpoint hammer? Or? No, you just put it there and you tape it. And, and just you, leave it and there. And you just leave it there. And that's really the treatment for a ganglion cyst. What, what is that? What is a ganglion cyst? Is it, it filled with water? It's, or? A, it's a fluid-filled sac that, that uh, I guess, occurs on the sheath or the, the lining of the, of the nerve. And uh, for whatever reason, it, it pops up. Sometimes trauma. Do they sometimes hurt? It can be painful. Um, Depending where it goes, right? It, it can be very painful. Um, so I just wanted to kind of share that with our listeners. If anybody you know, has any comments about a ganglion cyst or if you've been treated. But in the olden days, they used to take a Bible or a book and just smash it. That's almost kind of spooky. It, it really is. Um, so I didn't do that today, but that was just an interesting, <laughs> an interesting thing. But you shouldn't pick at them, right? No, you definitely should not pick at them. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think I have, um, I have some kind of OSD because when I see something like on my finger here, mm -hmm. I just because it's irritating, I just want to. Pull it off. You know, that's not good. We, we've I had, know it. We've had know several it. people come into the emergency room with, um, you know, like wounds or, you know, like they get cut or th they would develop an abscess and, and we would IND it. But a lot of times when you track back, it ends up starting like a pimple that they try to squeeze. It gets infected and, and it turns into this massive infection uh, abscess <laughs> that needs sometimes surgical intervention. I, I never told you about a surgery that I had to get when I was about 19. Mm-hmm. Because I had this little, it was about the size of a pinhead on my foot. And I was sitting there watching a movie one night or something. I, and I realized it was there. I didn't even know it was there. And I took my Swiss Army knife. Oh, Joe. And I just, like, I was messing with it. Oh, my gosh. And I, I popped it off. The next thing I know, within a couple of weeks, there was, like, 15 of them mm -hmm. all around. Within six months, they started getting big. Wow. And the whole, the arch of my foot was covered with them. And it was planter's warts mm -hmm. and apparently i seeded my foot you probably did the mother wart probably you know was I, exposed i had to actually get surgery where they go in and they needled in my foot about 20 times oh wow and i mean it was awful and they had to burn them and then mm -hmm. dig them out oh mm -hmm. you know it's horrible we have we've had podiatrists on on the show you know some really good shows talking about um podiatry general podiatry diabetic foot those kinds of things you know and i can tell you plantar fasciitis some of the things that occur in the foot you've got to be really careful when you when you deal with the feet and the hands when it comes to infection because there's not a whole lot of fat cushioning there and so you know if you have an infection for example on your finger or your toe that infection can spread to the bone pretty quickly and maybe you know now is just a good time to talk a little bit about what's called osteomyelitis um, which is an infection that goes down into the bone and that's very 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 difficult to treat once that happens wow. Um, you know, you're pretty much committed to IV antibiotics for like six weeks, eight weeks. I don't want that in my finger. Yeah, you mean really, you, you've got to be careful. When, when we see patients with an infection of either the hand or the feet, um, that's, a, that's serious. A puncture wound can, you know, you, really? you puncture your, your finger or your step on a nail. I just did it to my side. Now I'm, I'm hypochondriac you, you, again. Yeah, I know, because before the show we were talking about that. You've got to be very, very careful. Don't ignore that kind of stuff because it can turn into um, an infection and spread rapidly into the into the bone because of the blood flow just the way that the that the body is designed with the blood the blood supply um, and then end up with amputations and oh. you know, those kinds of things so you know in diabetics I think the message really is that diabetes causes peripheral neuropathy and peripheral neuropathy is basically um, like a blunting of the ability to 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 sense pain and so you know and mainly it occurs in the feet, sometimes in the fingers. You can develop this kind of numbness of the pads of the fingertips and so forth. But the feet are, is really what we need to be concerned with because you can walk around. And if you recall, in one of our shows, the podiatrist oh, I told the story that, you know, that his, his keys were in, in the shoe. You know, he went, his wife, I guess, threw the keys in the shoe, stepped on it, and, you know, ended up with a, with a key in the bottom of his foot for, you know, for who knows how long. That sets up infection. Wow. Um, so peripheral neuropathy is something that 
you know, is very, very real, especially in diabetics. Recommendation, and this is something really important to, to know and do, if you're a diabetic, um, be sure to check your feet. You know, make sure that you look under, you know, under the, the pads of the feet to make sure that there's no ulcer because you don't feel pain. You know, you can have an ulcer there and not know it. Um, it's important to wear white socks. And, and that was a, a point that came out mainly, not only for, you know, the coolness of the, of the cotton sock and the sweat and so forth, but if you do have an ulcer that bleeds, you'll be able to see it on the, on the sock. And that's a tip off really to, you know, to you Right. to your doc to, to make sure that, you know, if there's an infection And there. just never go barefooted. Absolutely never go barefooted. Again, a story was, you know, especially in, in the summertime here in Arizona, walking barefoot, you know, out in the street Burn or just, just to go get the mail, it can be vi- second, third degree burns. But as a diabetic, you don't feel it. It's not painful. So, you know, you go out, you walk around the pool, you go get the mail and your bare feet. Next thing you know, we had a patient that was, it was just a, an unbelievable burn on the bottom of both feet that ended up having to go to surgery. Uh, it was just a nightmare. And all out of just walking out, you know, in the backyard around the pool and, and bare feet. How do these fire walkers do it? Don't know. I mean, well, you know, I mean, that's, I'm, I'm sure that they prepare in terms of callus formation and, and those kinds of things. But, uh-huh. but if you're not prepared, you know, and you just go out and, and you do that and you don't really take care of, of it and, and not know it, that's the thing. You don't really know that that there's an infection on the bottom right. of your foot because you don't feel it. You know, peripheral neuropathy, I just, it, you know, we, when I think about that, I always think about what can we do to prevent it, you know, in, in patients that maybe you're just not diabetic, just, you know, I'm your regular. I'm going to take a few phone calls. Okay. You know, in your regular um, general population, sometimes you can develop peripheral neuropathy. Sometimes you can develop this uh, kind of nerve um, degeneration, if you will, Vitamin B6 has been really, really found to be helpful. Um, one example is carpal tunnel. Carpal tunnel syndrome is really a, uh, a constriction of the what we call the retinaculum or the band that goes across the wrist. Okay. And under that band, for whatever reason, you know, continued use, whether it's computer or occupational work or you know, just using the hand a lot uh, in your job most of the time, um, it gets inflamed. Inflammation presses on the nerve, the nerve overall and ultimately dies, and the sheath around the nerve, which is a fatty sheath, um, degenerates, and it leads to this painful um, neuropathy. And, and oftentimes, it's a shooting pain sensation that we call carpal tunnel syndrome. And what has been found to be very effective is using vitamin B6, particularly vitamin you know B complex, um, to help regenerate the sheath around the nerve. And I always think of it as, if you think of a uh, like a telephone wire, and it has that covering over the wire part of it. Well, it's that covering that really is um, begins to degenerate, and it's it's made up of you know fat and um, protein and you know different things. And, and the vitamin B6 helps to regenerate that outer uh, sheath or that coating. And so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is you know during the holidays we ha- we see what's called holiday heart. Alcohol tends to sometimes, in some people, stun the heart muscle. And you know, again, you know, just, just this morning we had a patient that, um, that, that I saw that has what's called a cardiomyopathy, where the heart muscle is weakened. And you know, in talking to them, you know, alcohol is a very significant part of their history, smoking and so forth. Um, but around the holiday season, when people are you know, drinking more than usual and so forth, it tends to stun the heart muscle and, and lead to what's called congestive heart failure. And we've talked about congestive heart failure in the past, but what happens is the muscle, the heart muscle, acts as a pump. And when it doesn't squeeze the way that it should to get blood out to the rest of the body, fluid backs up in the, in the lungs and it causes what's called congestive heart failure. And so one of the things, alcohol can do that. Um, you know, I know that there's been a lot of talk about alcohol and the positive effects of, you know, red wine and those kinds of things. Um, but I got to tell you that, that the alcohol component is really can be detrimental to the heart muscle. So that, that's, that's a problem. The other thing that I want to talk a little bit about is the eye, um, conjunctivitis. And, and, you know, a lot of times people talk about pink eye. You know, what is pink eye? Well, pink eye is exactly that. Your eye turns pink. The conjunctival vessels in the eye, where your white part of the eye 
looks, looks reddened. And oftentimes it's caused either by a virus or a bacteria. And you know, it's, it's caused by the viruses that are responsible for the common cold, just your general you know, garden variety viruses, usually self-limited. But the one point that I want to make, out, make, make today is that with pink eye, it is very contagious. And so if you find that you wake up one morning and your eye is closed and crusted and the vessels and the, and the white part of the eye is reddened, um, that basically is pink eye. We call it conjunctivitis. And it's very, very contagious. So oftentimes, you know, we've had nurses at the hospital who've been sent home uh, no, because, you know, the, you're, you're not allowed to work around patients when you have pink eye because you can possibly contaminate your patients or coworkers. So be very, very cautious um, of that pink eye, uh, especially if you, if you have the, the exudative kind of stuff that, that you wake up with and your eye is, you know, closed. Um, that's important. We treat it with an antibiotic eye drop. And the question is, well, how do you know if it's virus versus bacteria? Well, we don't. There's no way to know whether or not it's a virus or a bacteria. So we basically yeah. treat everybody that comes in with conjunctivitis with an antibacterial because sometimes you can have a virus that can, you know, eventually turn in, you can develop a super infection of a bacteria on top of it. And, and that can be pretty damaging if it's untreated. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Okay. When we look at eyes, when I, when I assess patients, I oftentimes um, you know, go through an entire assessment or an inspection you know, from, from the top of the head down. And when I look at somebody's eyes, the pupil size tells you a lot about what's going on in the body. Most of the time, the pupil should be equal. If I see somebody with a, with a pupil that is bigger or smaller, um, the first question I ask is, you know, is that something that you were born with? Did you know that your pupils were unequal or is that something that's new? Because neurologic problems uh, in the brain sometimes can manifest itself, you know, in no other way other than just showing pupillary size. And so that's something to, to, to know. And if, you know, if you don't know, you know, take a look at your pupils, take a look and see, you know, are they equal? because a lot of times we are born with one pupil that is bigger than the other, and that's just an important point to know to tell your doctor as a part of your history. Um, you know, moving into the new year, one of the things that in the hospitalist, which is my, my specialty, taking care of hospital patients, one of the things of the task force and the meetings at the hospital that we, that we work with with the staff is education. And I want to just kind of give a little synopsis of what, how to really prepare for if you're going to go into the hospital. For example, you know, there's no way to prepare if, you're going to, if there's an emergency room. But just things to keep in mind. You should always keep a list of your medications with you. And the names of the medication is important, but I got to tell you that the doses of the medication is important as well. So that's something that I think would be a really good New Year's resolution. If, you know, if you're on a bunch of medications, you know, make a list. Make sure that you, you, know, that you write it out put the dose and put the number of times that you take that medicine because that is really valuable information if, you know, God forbid you end up going to the emergency room or you need to be seen by a doctor. If you don't have that list of medicine, it's very, very difficult to treat you because sometimes there's interactions and, and we need to know. And it could be as simple as, and this is something I saw actually on CSI, so mm -hmm. I might be inaccurate here, mm -hmm. but it could be as simple as if you take, say, Prilosec regularly that right. could interact with, say, an antibiotic. It can. That's exactly right. That's why it's so important to know what the list of medicines you ha you're on coming in so that we don't give you something that's going to interfere. Allergies is the, is the other thing. You know, it's very, very important to know what your allergies are um, so that we know, you know, if you do come into the hospital, into the emergency room, what not to give you. Um, so those That's are the just two common things. sense. It really, it, but Joe, it's amazing how many people don't know that. Or and if you're in a car accident, there's no way to get that mm -hmm. out of you then, and somebody else doesn't know because right. you're your own person. Yeah. You got to keep track of your own stuff. You know, your history is so important to know. You know what? What? What's the past medical history? What? What operations may you know may have you may have had in the past? I mean, just so that we, if you need to come into the hospital, we as the hospital medical doctor can can take care of you. Because remember, we're not primary care docs. You know, we're not your doctor that you see on an ongoing basis, so we may not have that readily available when you hit the door. So just something to think about, you know, as we move into the new year to, to kind of do that kind of stuff. I, I think some people may assume that 
our medical charts and medical histories, if they go to a hospital, they like pull it up and it's magically it all appears on a computer, right. which there's no way it does. It does. We have an electron medical record system now. And, you know, even if you've been to our hospital, let's say last year, you know, your information is going to be there. But sometimes things change, you know, and sometimes your medications are changed. And it could be, I mean, it, it, truly, you're in the emergency room. It could be such an emergency and so stat that they're not going to go through everything to check interactions. You've got to be telling them. So right. what a great idea that is yeah. to keep a chart mm -hmm. or some kind of card that just simply says what you take and how right. often. You know, people, could save your life. It really can. People that have had pacemakers, wow. you know, they, they're given a card to keep in their wallet so that, so that exactly that, if they end up going into the emergency department, they know what kind of pacemaker it is that they that they had implanted and so they can pull that out it can be assessed it can be interrogated you know those little things are so important and i used to see people with bracelets on that say mm -hmm. like i have diabetes Absolutely. or i have yeah whatever. or a dog tag or something right like that. right you know that's important to you know to have put it on your iphone you know I me mean, nowadays you can you can just take a picture of a list and have it you know in your phone with your with your photos and then that way you can you can have access to just it just don't put a chip in your head for scanning yeah, right you don't want to do that <laughs> do you have some questions there we do we do and 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 how we're doing this for those of you that are tuning in for the first time and i see we've got some chat as well i appreciate that um I turn the phone lines off when I'm about to ask questions, so I'll take several questions, write them down, then we, we ask them while the phones are up, then I'll get right back to you. So yeah. if you're calling in, I see the lines are going, just continue to call in and I'll, I will pick it up. I, you know, I love to see the lines. It, it me tells too. me that people me are engaged, that they want to connect with us. That's, that's great. Um, and if you didn't get our newsletter, they're going to start going out every week, so just uh, make sure you jump on our website. It's very easy. Um, just sign up for our newsletter. It's very simple. You don't have to give out any information other than your email address. And you'll get our up-to-date newsletters and uh, our information. Let's go to Barb from Gilbert, our first call right here from our hometown in Gilbert. And this is a good question. Um, what do we do now if we are diabetic with all the studies coming out about diet sugar being so dangerous? Help, I love sweets. Barb from Gilbert. You know, it's, it's all about moderation. I mean, it really is about moderation. I think the first thing that I tell my diabetics um, is lifestyle modification, exercise, absolutely vitally important you know because what that does we know that um, you know even if you're 10 pounds overweight 15 pounds overweight if you lose that weight l you can literally reverse the need for diabetic medication and so that's very important to know you know and then and then when you do have an opportunity like during the holiday to eat something sweet I mean you know you can do that as long as it's all in moderation Carbohydrates, huge, to make sure that you, you, know, you have a good handle on balancing, counting carbs. Um, because it really all has to do with you know, insulin and insulin and the response to carbohydrates in the body. And so just keeping that balanced is just absolutely important. Let me ask you, um, is there any, I've read a lot about the stevia. Mm -hmm. okay. Is that a lot better? I mean, is it the solution for diet sugar? You know, I don't, uh, personally, I don't think it is. Uh, you know, I'm not one that, now stevia is one of the natural, the more natural, um, sh you know, but sugar. But it's still processed, It right? is still processed, and, and I think that's, that's the problem. You know, that stuff would never cross my lips, you know, and, and that's me personally talking. But, you know, for, for patients, I mean, if you find that that's one thing that would get you close, uh, a step closer, then maybe that's the transition that you need to make in order to get to a point where it is balanced. Um, but I think just the conversation, being aware of it, is very, very important. I can't stress how much and how important exercise is, even if it's just walking. Um, because what that does is it releases certain chemicals in the body that, um, that kind of regulate insulin and you know, glucose um, you know, regulation in the body from the liver on up. There's something called gluconeogenesis in the body. And you know, a lot of times if, you, if you're sedentary and you're not active and let's say you're overweight and, and on top of that you have diabetes, what's going to happen is at the level of the liver, the liver is going to make this what's called gluconeogenesis. It's going to make glucose endogenous in the body and it's going to spit it out. So that's going to cause your sugars to go up. Wow. When you exercise, it turns that mechanism off. And that's a really important thing to know that a lot of people don't really realize. And, and it's just as simple as even just getting up and, and, you know, and walking and, and just moving 15 minutes a day. You know, those kinds of things. It's so important. And if you look at it as a, a doctor once told me, um, think about your, the diabetic pills that mm -hmm. you take. Mm -hmm. And 
think about if you walk a mile or two, that's like taking one of those pills. It's true. You know, I, while we're talking about glucose, we were talking just yesterday, last evening, uh, you know, with my family, and we were talking about the glu glucose monitor. They have this new thing out where they're marketing this, you know, bloodless, if you will, glucose monitor where you don't have to stick your finger. You know, and I did a little bit of research, and, and there is no such thing. What it is, basically, is it's a monitor that still requires blood, but it doesn't have to be taken from the fingertip. You know, there's no shortcut. If, you're, if we're going to measure oh, glucose... Oh, that's what I've been doing for a long time. I just I do it up here. Exactly. And it doesn't hurt. And it doesn't way. hurt. I mean, every once in a while, you can hit a place that does hurt. Right. But for the most part, you don't even feel it. Right. And but I slap myself. You, but I don't, know of a, I don't know of a monitor that is on the market today that you don't need to get some kind like of blood. A, or yeah, on your I mean, tongue there's or no saliva. I mean, as far as I know, there, that doesn't exist. What does exist, which is really neat, is, is a monitor that you can attach to the iPhone. You know, a lot of people have iPhones now. It's it's really really amazing. You, you know, you have this iPhone, and on the bottom of the iPhone, you, you connect it. It's about maybe two inches, three inches, and there's a place for the sh the, the test strip wow. that goes right into it. And literally, your iPhone turns into a glucose monitor. That's really cool. As long as it doesn't send it up to Facebook, right? Yeah, well, you, you know, you can't actually, <laughs> oh I guess. Gosh. But I mean, there's, you know, that's that's kind of it's a, amazing. It isn't is it? amazing what's out there. There's an app for everything. It, it's it crazy. seems like. Yeah. What else do you have there, Joe? Um, let's see. Let's get to um, Rick out there. How is it possible that cortisol, in relation to in relation to weight loss and intense exercise, how is it that cortisol would suppress weight loss? Okay. That, let me let me just. That's a good question. Um, let's talk about cortisol first. Cortisol is a stress chemical in the body. And when we're stressed, cortisol levels go up. Um, and so what happens is when cortisol levels are high over periods of time, fat deposition, fat deposits around the, the, in, the abdominal area. Studies show that. So people who, for example, um, have high levels of cortisol, there's a syndrome called Cushing syndrome, for example, that have you know, endogenous, where your body makes cortisol at higher levels, those people have higher levels and higher amounts of fat deposited around the abdominal girth. Stress causes cortisol level to go up. And so as a result, it causes deposition of fat in the abdominal area, and it's very, very difficult to lose weight when you're stressed. That's wow. why it is so important to manage stress. That's why, you know, we talk about... Um, you know, relaxation exercises, especially in diabetics, especially in people that have heart disease, high, you know, high blood pressure. We want to get that cortisol level down because it is very, very difficult to lose weight when the cortisol level is high. Let me give you an example. Somebody comes in um, that has underlying bad emphysema, lung disease, requiring prednisone. That's one of the treatments that we use steroids for the lung. Well, when we treat patients with steroids over long periods of time, that cortisol level, it's the same thing, it's a steroid in the body, is high. And over time, they develop, you know, increased fat deposition, abdominal girth, what we call moon faces, that, you know, the face gets kind of full, they gain weight, blood pressure goes up, a lot of different side effects from, you know, long-term steroid use. It is very difficult to lose weight when you're on steroids. Is it water retention? Well, it, it, water retention is part of it, but the other part is a molecular deposition of fat in that part of the body. And it causes increased appetite. Um, you know, it causes vasoconstriction. It causes blood pressure up. So steroids over, like people that are rheumatoid arthritis who are on steroids, people that have underlying lung disease on steroids, over long periods of time, it's very, very difficult for them to lose weight because of that. So I think that's what the question is in reference to. So that's why we try to really taper down the steroid as fast, um, well, not fast, but over time as, as soon as possible because we don't want patients to be on steroids if it's not necessary because of the side effect profile. So it is absolutely difficult to lose weight when you're on, when you're on steroids. Do you have another question there, Joe? Um, yeah, let's get to uh, Fred from Portland, Oregon. He would like to know, is beer bad for you if you drink the ultra, like 64 calorie or the ultra light beers that really hardly even tastes like mm -hmm. beer, but you're drinking beer? You know, I think, I think if you're going to drink beer, that's probably a great choice. Um, the question is, what other medical problems do you have? You know, if you have, if you tell me that you have a history of, you know, heart disease, high blood pressure, uh, congestive heart failure, liver disease, beer is probably not a good choice. 
if you, you know, are healthy, you don't have liver problems, you don't have those problems, probably, you know, not a bad thing to do. If you're going to choose one versus the other, the ultralight is probably a good choice because of the calorie. You know, there's a lot of calories in beer. It's is empty. There? It's empty calories. Gotcha. And, um, you know, and that's, that's part of the problem. But if you're interested in, you know, health and wellness and losing weight, probably a good choice, you know, as long as there's no other contraindication to, to drinking it. Just want to kind of throw out there, just while we're talking about alcohol, medication sometimes people don't think about can interact with alcohol. For example, um, you know, pain medicines we know and, and those kinds of things, antibiotics. But Coumadin is a blood thinner. And people who are on Coumadin, we recommend absolutely not to drink alcohol. And the reason is not necessarily the interaction molecularly in terms of, you know, alcohol causing a problem with the Coumadin. But the problem is, is that when you're on Coumadin as a blood thinner, you have the potential to bleed. And if you drink too much alcohol and you, you know, bump your head or you bump into something, the chances of you bleeding internally is higher. Oh, internally. And that's the problem. You know, we don't want you to fall and bump your head, right? Because right. If, you're on, if you're on a blood thinner, you potentially could, you know, develop a, an intracranial bleed or run into something, you know, I mean, so those, so there's other reasons why we, we talk about not using alcohol with certain medications other than just the interaction of causing confusion and, you know, potentiating the effects of pain medicines or narcotics, those kinds of things. Just keep that in mind. Again, know what medicines you're on and so that, you know, so that your doctor can, can make sure that a recommendation is made that, that is not detrimental. And even over-the-counter stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tylenol. You know, we get Tylenol over-the-counter. That can be a problem. Motrin. You know, we've talked about it how many times on the show in terms of, you know, ibuprofen, Motrin, Advil. I'm surprised some people that I know from, from working the clubs for so long mm -hmm. are still alive from just the amount of Tylenol they take. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> let's kind of, I just want to, this is a good time to talk about Tylenol and Motrin because a lot of people think that it's the same. You know, Tylenol, acetaminophen, is different than Advil, ibuprofen, anti-inflammatories. Totally, totally different. And they can be taken together. So Tylenol, acetaminophen, is the other name. Um, the reason that we have a, you know, we're cautious with Tylenol is because it could be very, very toxic to the liver. It's the liver that we have to be careful with with Tylenol. Um, people that come in this time of year, you know, we see overdoses and suicide attempts and those kinds of things. And, and one of the things that we see a lot of is people taking a handful of Tylenol, Tylenol overdose. It's probably the worst thing that you can do if you're trying to commit suicide because number one, it's not going to, you know, cause you to, to die immediately. It's going it, to hurt. It's going to cause long-term oh. damage to the liver. And the number one cause of, you know, like in a suicide attempt scenario, people developing liver failure requiring liver transplant. I mean, how, you know, how, uh. how awful is that? So oh. be cautious with Tylenol because it could be very damaging to the liver as opposed to ibuprofen, Advil, Motrin, those kinds of things. That's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Tylenol is a steroidal? No. Tylenol is, oh, is gotcha. totally Sorry. different. It's a totally different molecule. That's where a lot of people get confused. Two totally different things. Tylenol is acetaminophen, completely different class. Pain medicine, it's great for headaches. It's great for, you know, if you have a toothache and, you know, those kinds of things in moderation is recommended. 650 milligrams, you know, no more than three to four times a day. Um, but ibuprofen, anti-inflammatory, can do a lot of things to the body. It can cause ulcers in the stomach. It can cause gastritis. It kind of is very toxic to the lining of the stomach. And ibuprofen is given so often for so many different anti-inflammatory things. It is, but you've got to be... That people just go, oh, it's like candy. It is, and you've got to be really, really careful. More times than not, I've seen people, you know, with GI bleeds coming in just bleeding internally from too much ibuprofen. Kidney failure. Joe, it's amazing, you know, how, how we don't really think about, you know, being dehydrated, you know, on top of that, taking ibuprofen and then continuing to take more ibuprofen, you end up really cooking your, your, your kidneys. And remember, guys, this time of the year when, when everybody who knows somebody who's sick right now, yeah. you know, everybody seems to know somebody, remember, if you're taking it, you have a fever and you go take some Tylenol or some Motrin, 
and then you go, well, you know, I'm stuffy and sneezy. I, I'm, I'm going to take some Theraflu, mm-hmm. and oh, let me make sure I take some uh, some of this. Right. These all have those agents in it there, does. That's and right. you can really end up with a really big dose by taking right. several things you don't even think has that aspirin or Tylenol or whatever, you know, exactly. in there. Exactly. You know, Alka-Seltzer, Alka-Seltzer has aspirin in it. Um, and, you know, the, the one that comes to mind just most recently, a GI bleed that we admitted into the hospital, um, denied a history of taking Advil, ibuprofen, aspirin, um, but took like double the amount of Alka-Seltzer. And, and Alka-Seltzer has a large amount of what? aspirin in it. And it was the Alka-Seltzer that actually caused the gastritis and led to a GI bleed, requiring blood transfusion and, and all of that. So, um, oh so you've gosh. got to be really, really careful. And, and that's why I say, you know, know what medicines you're on. Make sure that you list even herbal medicines, over-the-counter medicines, supplements, you know, those kinds of things. And if you're one of those people that like to drink around the holidays, make sure you don't go back to, you know, when I was, when I was young, I, I often thought, when I was in my 20s, I thought, well, you know, if you take a few Tylenol and then you go drinking, you're not going to have a hangover. Mm-hmm. That is a huge myth. That's a dangerous one to walk, yeah, isn't you, it? You've got to be careful. I mean, you just have to be careful. Um, and some people it works, but you know, what else? Do you have another Teresa question? from AJ. Um, I got a puncture by a goat head on Christmas Eve. Uh, it really hurts now and is red and hot. I'm diabetic. Should I go and get this checked out? I figured it would just get better and go away. Abs- Teresa, absolutely. A um, couple things. You know, being that you're a diabetic, number one tells me that you know your immune system just in general is probably not on par with you know with the non-diabetic so your ability to fight infection is probably compromised just being diabetic period any puncture wound um, and I don't know if it's in the on the hand or foot or, or especially if it's on the foot you, a goat head so I think you must you must have stepped on it yeah you know so absolutely it's red it's warm those are the signs and symptoms of infection um, so uh, let me just recommend that you you know, get in, call your doc today. And if you can't get in, you know, go to, to an ER. Because and, and she wanted to know, where is the Florence Hospital? Florence Hospital in Anthem is right on Hunt Highway. Um, actually. From AJ, you just would take mm-hmm. um, Ironwood mm-hmm, across. to Hunt Highway and right. go east. And there's no wait. I mean, that's really, you know, that's really what, or go to the closest urgent care or, or you know, or whatever. But um, but my recommendation to you is, is, you know, get seen and get seen today because you probably need an antibiotic. Um, before that gets that gets out of control and you know again for the listeners out there um, just be aware signs and symptoms of infection you know it starts really with you keeping an eye on it and and getting it treated before it turns into something that you need to be hospitalized for you know hopefully I never see people that have these puncture wounds and, and, and infections because if they're treated appropriately they can be treated as an outpatient it's when they are resistant it's when they're not treated in a timely manner um, is when the problem is, then you end up coming into the hospital. And then when you develop what's called a bacteremia, where bacteria flows through the blood, you can end up developing endocarditis, bacteria can settle on the heart valve. You know, these are the things that, that I think about every time I see a patient to try to protect you against. So I'm going to put you on the broadest spectrum antibiotic. If you continue to spike fevers, we're going to check you know, the heart and do an echo to make sure that there's nothing flopping around the heart valve because I got to tell you, it's real. It's real. And, but it can be prevented. And that's really what the message is. Um, You know, you've got to take, take control of your health and moving into this new year, 2013, you know, let's move into it. You know, on the show, we're going to be talking about, you know, preventative things and things to preserve health and well-being. Um, It has to start early you know on the outpatient side when by the time you get into the hospital you know it, that's when you don't want to come into the hospital for that kind of stuff you should be able to treat it as an outpatient antibiotics you know is something that that I want to just take a moment and talk about for for a minute because I think in general antibiotics are overused I think that um, the whole health medical profession as a whole uh, studies show that that we probably on the outpatient side, in family docs offices, primary care offices, urgent cares, ERs, you know, a lot of times we'll treat with antibiotics um, in, in cases and scenarios that maybe an antibiotic isn't necessarily indicated. Um, th- there's two schools of thought. One is that if you treat inappropriately with an antibiotic, let's say you have you know, a urinary tract infection and you don't really check it, you just treat it and you keep treating it, what's going to happen is you're going to become resistant. And we always try to limit antibiotic use because, not because we want to withhold from, you know, from patients, but what we want to do is try to prevent 
the resistant patterns of the antibiotics in the community. Um, and that makes sense because when you develop like an outbreak of, of, of a resistant antibiotic, literally there's nothing we can do to treat that. If, if somebody has a resistant strain, for example, um, you know, people die from that. So, you know, so we've got to be very careful not to overuse or misuse antibiotics. At the same time, though, we want to make sure that we adequately treat. And so if you do have, for example, symptoms of a urinary tract infection, it's important to get it checked, um, get it tested, identify the bacteria, and then treat it appropriately. If you have, for example, you know, a puncture wound, and it's red, and it's hot, and it's swollen, and there's pus there, um, you know, that's a bacterial infection until proven otherwise. That's not a virus, you know. So in that case, absolutely an antibiotic is recommended. Where we get caught is really in the upper respiratory symptoms, colds, coughs, sinus infections, those kinds of things. You know, if somebody has, you know, has this upper respiratory type, you know, nose sniffling, clear drainage, cough that's not productive, maybe even fevers, usually that's viral. Um, and an antibiotic oftentimes is not really indicated in that, in that case. It's when the stuff that you cough out turns yellow or green, uh, the nasal drainage turns color. That indicates more of a bacterial base, and that's what an antibiotic is oftentimes used for. So just something to kind of think about in terms of, you know, requesting antibiotics, you know, using them. Uh, we just want to make sure that there's an appropriate place uh, in time. And oftentimes it's starting sooner rather than later for those cases that we know are bacterial. While we're waiting, Joe has some, some questions and things coming. I want to just talk about something called inulin. Now, for those of you listening, I want you to hear it's not insulin, it's inulin. And inulin is a special type of carbohydrate that, um, that's found in certain foods. And people who, for example, have uh, irritable bowel, uh, diverticulosis, diverticulitis type symptoms, um, you know, those kinds of GI things. What happens a lot of times is undigested food kind of sits in the gut and can set up an infection. People with diverticulosis know that, right? Um, irritable bowel, those kinds of things. But if you eat certain foods that have what's called inulin, inulin is a carbohydrate that literally the body does not digest. So it's, it's kind of like a, um, it's a bulk, you know, it's a carbohydrate that passes through the gut and it really helps to, to carry with it undigested food, uh, even sometimes you know, in, the, in the bacteria, flora of the gut, it helps to kind of cleanse that and move it through. And the foods that contain inulin, for example, artichoke. Artichoke is probably a great source of inulin, which is an undigested form of carbohydrate that just helps to carry through the digestive tract to help kind of cleanse it, if you will. Um, asparagus is another good great source of what we call inulin. Chicory root, even bananas. Um, bananas are, are very good. But bananas is really good for the digestive tract in general. For example, people that have um, H. pylori, and we've talked about that in the past, where uh, Helicobacter pylori, which is a bacteria that, that affects the upper stomach in the stomach area, um, it's a bacteria, it causes acid reflux. Bananas tends to help kind of calm that and, and almost even eradicate it in some cases. But I think that's extreme in talking about eradicating it. What we want to do is treat it appropriately with an antibiotic. And so when we're talking about antibiotic treatment, um, gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is acid reflux, caused by a bacteria, okay. Prilosec, Pepsid, Zantac, Tagamet, all of those antacids are good, but none of them are going to be um, effective in treating H. pylori which is the cause of some people developing gastroesophageal reflux. So if you do have reflux, for example, you feel this burning sensation, acid reflux from the stomach up into the esophagus and into the throat, kind of a sour taste, that doesn't get better. Um, it's important to get tested. And the only way to test the H. pylori, well, there's several ways, but the one way that is uh, very effective is a simple blood test. In people who have H. pylori, we recommend treating with an antibiotic, a 10-day course, triple, actually tri triple treatment, two antibiotics along with the acid suppressive Prilosec, Protonics, and that eradicates it. It basically clears the bacteria from the, from the stomach. You now people ask me, well, how do I get that? You know, how do, how do you catch H. pylori? Well, you know, I'm not sure that we know, um, but I can tell you that 
a lot of times if you we get it somehow ingested so whether it's you know if you eat lettuce or you eat something you know and it's not cleaned appropriately you might get it that way if you drink out of a soda can that may not be cleansed appropriately you can get it there's so many different ways to uh, ingest a bacteria um, th there's no way to know there's just absolutely no way to know and so the best thing is if you if you have the symptoms uh, it needs to be treated why does it need to be treated well, symptom-wise, you're really not going to get rid of the symptoms until it's treated, but there's a higher incidence of gastric cancer in people that have H. pylori. And so, you know, that's a given. So in, anytime we see somebody in the hospital side, if, they're, if they have, you know, ulcers, um, if they have esophageal reflux that leads to ulcers, we always want to make sure that it's not an infection caused by H. pylori because it does increase the risk of, of gastric cancer. Um, and so that's just another reason to, to use an antibiotic. I think we have some calls coming and some different different things happening. We do. We've got uh, we've got some some good questions here. Uh, let's see. Jerry from Colorado Springs would like to know, have you heard about resetting the taste buds because of the use of too much chemicals in your food? Um, clogged taste buds would like to know about that. You know, well, first of all, I think that's a that's a that's a very real thing. I mean, for those of you listening, it is possible for the taste buds to uh, become ineffective with certain chemotherapy, medication, some antibiotics. As far as, you know, resetting the taste buds, I'm not sure of, of what exactly Jerry's talking about. I don't know of any mechanism or anything like that, that uh, that's used to, to reset the taste buds. What I do know is that once the chemotherapy is done or once the antibiotic is done, it's reversible. Taste buds, you know, do regenerate and do come back. So you don't, you don't taste things then? Or? Uh, yeah, right. You, I mean, you can develop, um, you know, um, decreased sensation to taste, you know, have a difficult time differentiating salt versus sweet, oh, wow. sour. I mean, those are the, the main, you know, the main taste bud uh, receptors. Um, but the other thing is sometimes people just have a metallic taste, you know, so you have this kind of um, abnormal taste in your mouth that just is always there. And like I said, antibiotics. You know what you're talking about. I took Lunesta one time to go to sleep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I woke up in the morning, mm -hmm. it was horrible. Right. It right. was like metal. And when you stop it, it gets better. You uh -huh. know, so it is reversible. But in terms of like resetting that, I, I don't know of any technique or You don't take a anything. paper clip and don't know. hit that little button yeah. somewhere? As far as I know, medically, you know, uh, standard of care treatment, I don't know anything from, let's, from that perspective. Uh, let's get to Mary Peterson and... Uh, Thanks, Jerry, for that question. Mary Peterson from Tucson. I have had loose bowel movements, and after I eat, almost immediate diarrhea and serious stomach pains. This has been going on for three weeks. What do you recommend, and what could it be? Okay. Um, well, a couple of things. First thing, you know, I would want to make sure, number one, if it's only three weeks, and it's just you know, kind of more of an acute onset, I would want to make sure that there's no infection. Um, so that would be the number one thing. Make sure there's no infection in the body. H. pylori we just talked about. But, you know, ch check that out. Make sure that there's nothing infectious. Did you, you know, can you think of something that you may have eaten that wasn't well cooked? Um, but beyond that, something that, that I always think about when I hear that history is, you know, do you have lactose intolerance? Is it, you know, is it that now you're eating something or doing something different? And that's the question in, in the history. You know, what three weeks ago changed are you now drinking coffee with cream in it, for example? Did you recently buy a cow and now you know, you're drinking a lot more milk? Exactly. I mean, who, you know, is there something where you're increasing or changing your diet where you're bringing more dairy products? Because lactose intolerance is, is very, very common. I, I believe like one in three, one in four adults have, you know, some type of lactose intolerance where the body just lacks the enzyme to break down, you know, lactose. And, and for those people that don't know exactly what kind of things that would be, and I'm going to go through that. Oh, good. So, okay. you know, so the, the things that contain lactose are, are dairy products, milk, cheese, you know, I mean, those are the big ones. Anything that contains dairy product in ice it. Ice cream. Ice cream, yo you know, some, some types of yogurts, butter. People don't think about, you know, putting cream in their coffee. You know, you, you, you drink a coffee, but, you know, you, you deny ever eating anything. That's why they say non-dairy creamers. Correct. Aha. Uh -huh. Correct. And that's why. So what I would recommend is, um, is maybe look at your diet, avoid anything that, you know, has dairy in it. Maybe go to the, to the, uh, to the food store and get something called lactaid. They come in little pills or even milk. It's a substitute. It's a milk substitute that contains the enzyme that your body is lacking. And it's amazing. It's almost like, you know, within 24 hours, it, it, it just re it resolves. 
Um, now, on the other hand, the other things that we would want to look at and not ignore would be, you know, is there something going on in the intestinal tract? You know, do, is there a colitis going on? Or is there something else that's causing, you know, the loose bowel movements? You know, depending on age, we recommend a colonoscopy to be done, you know, from the age of 50 on as a screening, you know. So those are the other things. Is there blood there with the, with the stools, um, you know, that, that we would want to kind of identify? Are there different colors in the blood in... in in stool, and it sounds kind of weird yeah, that you, know, you it, should be concerned it, about. It is, and so let me just kind of, you know, it's a, it's important, you know, what, earlier in the show I was talking about, you know, look at the eye, look at the pupils, know kind of the anatomy of your body. You know, if, if you have one that's different, the same, you know, with the stool, if you notice that, you know, that your stools are real dark or black, that indicates one thing versus real bright red blood. And so, you know, that's important history that your doctor's going to want to know. Um, both both contain blood. Um, if you're bleeding from the upper tract, meaning in the stomach, the upper part of the intestine, you know, kind of the duodenum, small intestine, when there's an ulcer there that bleeds, by the time that blood gets down and out in the stool, it actually oxidizes and it turns black. And so anytime you see black, tarry looking stools, um, that suggests one of a couple things. One, we want to make sure there's no ulcer. Most common causes, what we talked about, Advil, ibuprofen, aspirin, causing an ulcer, causing then bleeding, which looks like black, tarry kind of stools. The other thing that can cause black appearing stools is like Pepto-Bismol. You know, now Pepto-Bismol can make your stools look dark. Iron can make the stools look black, but it doesn't contain blood. So that's where it's important to kind of get a history. Bright red blood in the stool is suggestive of a lower GI bleed. Something that, hemorrhoids, internal hemorrhoid, external hemorrhoid, colon, you know, something going on in the colon, a polyp or something bleeding, because it doesn't have a lot of space to go to get out. And so if it's bleeding, it's more fresh, and it, it looks red. Maroon looking blood with blood clots, more can be a combination of upper, lower, sometimes you can have more like in the middle, and it's very difficult to differentiate. That's the hardest to really differentiate uh, in terms of identifying the source of maroon colored stools because it's probably more in the sigmoid, in the, in the cecum area, consistent with colitis, you know, those kinds of things. That's why colonoscopies are important to, to identify, you know, a location of, of bleeding if, if that's what we suspect. And if you are a, a new drinker of like crystal light and those, those deep red um, Kool-Aids, those seem mm -hmm. to, with the artificial sweeteners, they seem to, at least to me, yep. they seem to pass right through me. Yes, and Joe, you know, another thing, beets. It's really important to, you know, again, it's, it's part of the history. You know, if you're eating, for example, fresh beets, you know, that you never ate before, and now you see that there's red blood, well, it looks like blood, but really is not blood, um, that's an important piece of the puzzle that needs to be put together because, you know, it's just a matter of rolling things out. Um, but, but we've got to start somewhere, and, and it, it's just a matter of identifying, um, you know, different colors and those kinds of things in the stool because it's important. You know, while we're talking about stool and, and you know, somebody called in, white. If, if you notice um, that the stool is white, chalky color, um, there's not a whole lot of things in the, in the human body that can cause, like, white or it doesn't contain bile. It's just white stool. And that is suggestive of liver disease. And so, you know, anytime, you know, when I do a history on somebody, if, if somebody tells me that, you know what, I've noticed that, that my stool is real, real white, um, the first thing I look at is the liver. So those are the kind of things that can, that can tip off, you know, what's going on in the environment, you know, inside the body. So it's important to kind of keep track of um, a history of, of, you know, what's going on so that it's important to tell the physician, your doctor, the emergency room, or whatever the case may be. Because the only way that we're going to be able to put two and two together is if we get that history to kind of put it together. Another question, Joe? We had Tom uh, from Banner Hospitals call in. Oh, wow. And wanted to let us know about a new uh, deadly spider that was uh, mm -hmm. recognized in Arizona. 20 times more venomous than the brown recluse. Wow. I looked on Google, but I, I didn't seem to find it anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I like to verify my data. So those of you that, uh, if anybody knows about it, let, you know, let us know. Um, but you may just want to keep that in mind. I can't verify that mm -hmm. right now, but uh, definitely 
Uh, have you heard about that? I, no, I haven't. I mean, that's probably more in the ER, but I, you know, we've not. How I would get connected to you know that somebody that would be bit would be if that spider bite became very infected and they were admitted into the hospital. Um, and so that you know that just if if you are, for example, mosquito bites spider bites, those kinds of things. A lot of times you can get itchy, itchy, you know, areas around that. The worst thing you can do is scratch something on your skin, like a, like a spider bite or an insect bite or a mosquito bite, because what happens is under the fingernail, there's a lot of bacteria. No matter how many times you clean your hands and wash your hands, we, we harbor bacteria on our skin. And when you scratch, and even a very minute microscopic opening of the skin can introduce bacteria a lot of times in the leg, you know, you'll scratch the leg, the skin is dry this time of the year. Um, it's the worst thing that you can do because what you're doing is you're introducing bacteria, not only that's on the surface of the leg itself or the hand itself, but underneath the nail, you actually inoculate your own body. Oh, wow. And, and that's a problem, you know, and again, that sets up infection. So be very, very cautious, you know, of, of doing those kinds of things. Rubbing your eye, you know, to the point where, you know, you're, if your hands aren't clean, it, it, that's how you inoculate it and you infect the different parts of the body. Wow. Um, so just be cautious of that. And um, we, we had a, uh, a listener out there recommend that we put out to the public uh, if there's anything that they would like to hear for future Doc Absolutely. Talk shows. And we would love to get your input, whether it be on the Doc Talk website, mm -hmm. Facebook, email. Um, shoot you, you know, shoot us your, your ideas, and we would love to entertain uh, whatever Absolutely. whatever people want to, to be brought I mean, to the show. The, the show really is, is for you. I mean, it's right. really about, you know, taking an hour out of my day from the hospital, coming over, and, and, and really just sitting and, and having a conversation, sharing some interesting cases, and really listening to questions so that we can address them and maybe bring some, you know, it, it might help somebody, you know, down the road. Maybe or, some peace or of mind or maybe yeah. get somebody in if they need to be seen and they don't, you know, Absolutely. maybe they don't, they're on the edge of wondering if they need to go in. And I think we, we need to be, you know, just, just more free with information to help prevent, you know, uh, for example, if somebody has diabetes, we want to make sure that they, they have all the information to, um, to take every effort to prevent that diabetes from, you know, leading to the heart disease, the stroke, you know, those kinds of things that we know are, are part, of the, part of the problem. And if you are not a subscriber to our newsletter, please go to our website, kqck.com um, or kqcklive.com KQCK and, and just, you know, subscribe to our, to our newsletter and uh, you'll get the show updates and, and things that are going on, new things with the station and, and our shows. And um, we certainly appreciate that and all comments as well. We have like I looked at the clock and it threw me off yeah. because we I have looked like two and it was minutes. yeah right. It's just amazing. It, it is. Um, you know, just in, as we wrap up, I just want to talk a, a moment about you know we're in the winter season now. Um, carbon monoxide poisoning is something that you know not long ago we had a patient come in that that had carbon monoxide poisoning. Monoxide. That's like from a tailpipe of a vehicle. It can be yes, and um, and it's something that you know that that we're not aware of. You know, it it doesn't. There's no scent to it. Um, in the home, just like we have fire, um, you know, monitors and so forth, it might be a good idea to get a carbon monoxide monitor because a lot of times there can be leaks in the, you know, in the home, gas leaks and those kinds of things, and not know it. What does carbon monoxide come from? It comes from wood burning, you know, wood burning fire, um, you know, different, you know, the car, like you said, the so exhaust. So as little as like a fireplace. It can be from a fireplace. Um, a lot of homes, a lot of the like manufactured homes, sometimes they have these um, free standalone heaters, propanes. propanes, those kinds of things. You know, in a closed space, you've got to be very, very careful of being um, overcome by carbon monoxide. And how it presents is confusion, and it can actually lead to, you know, coma and death. And so, you know, the way we treat it is with hyperbaric oxygen. You know, you want to get into the ER, you want to get 100% of oxygen because it, it actually removes the, at the molecular level in the blood carbon monoxide and replaces it with oxygen. But the blood cell has a higher affinity to want to hold on to carbon monoxide as opposed to oxygen. Is there a hyperbaric chamber in one of the... There's the many of them. They're, they're all over the valley. Um, in fact, they just call it from Banner. There's a couple over at Banner, over at Chandler. There's, you know, oh, there's wow. hyperbaric chambers all over. And we, we, we say, you know, go for a dive because it's what used to treat, you know, the bends, you know, people scuba diving and so forth. So just something to be aware of. Um, and maybe find out a little bit more information 
you know, in your own home, in your own environment, in your own community, um, you know, to protect yourself from carbon monoxide and, and the poisoning that can, that can go with it. Joe, we're out of time. This, this really, it really went fast today. Um, but it's, you know, it's great to be here. We're going to move into the new year, uh, sponsored by Gilbert Hospital and Florence Hospital at Anthem. If you haven't checked us out on Facebook, you know, absolutely check us out, the DocTalkRadio.com website. Um, and we really, again, want to welcome people, you know, to, to let me know what you want to talk about, what you want to hear about, um, because that's really what this is about. And, and I would really like to see on the Doc Talk uh, website. I hadn't mentioned this to you, but mm -hmm. as I as I get calls, I, I start to think about that, and I don't want to forget. If if people call in, if you want to send us a note and, and let us know if if Doc Talk Radio has done something for you, if if it's helped you in some way, or if you like it, we'd love to get some testimonials. It would be even great. on the Facebook, mm -hmm. or I mean, I, I'd love to see some of those because I I get so, I get so much feedback of people oh you know I love this and thank you for doing this and, and the information was you know a godsend for this and right. I think we ought to post some of that it stuff would be great it would be really um, great we can actually post it in the hospital I know there's a wall that we're kind of targeting that's gonna be perfect. the doc talk wall so um, so yeah there's a lot of great great ideas but you know we welcome that kind of stuff all right well uh, all right. another great episode post 2012 Christmas episode of mm -hmm. doc talk radio all right. is it um, Next week, is it after, it would be after the first of the year then, wouldn't it? I think so. I think so, too. I think the first is mm -hmm. Tuesday of next week. Right. So, so we'll be here. We'll in, be in back next, next year. year. We'll see you next year. All right. Thanks for listening. This concludes Doc Talk Radio with Dr. Ann Borick. Till next time, I wish you health, wellness, and many blessings. Doc Talk Radio is brought to you by Gilbert Hospital and Florence and Anthem Hospitals. Topics discussed are for informational and not intended to substitute advice from your personal physician.